Um, all right, so the, the first part here was, was kind of to build a bridge between uh, some of the small sum set problems in, in additive number theory and uh, connectivity questions in vertex transitive graphs and digraphs. And uh, um, yeah, we, we kind of saw, you know, we saw sort of the same techniques, same kind of intersection union argument taking place. And um, <clears throat> um, and in fact, there are some very concrete questions there, or concrete statements. Really, we can reinterpret Cauchy Davenport as a statement about connectivity of of Cayley graphs over ZP. Uh, At any rate, so now I'm going to switch topics completely, and uh, we're just going to jump to a whole new setting, and I'm going to prove uh, a, a particularly lovely theorem due to Shriver and Seymour. Uh, but before we state that, I'd like to, well, I'd like to be big picture here at the start. So, um, <clears throat> so G is still a group, and now um, I want to think back to that um, erdos ginzburg ziv theorem. So if you remember erdos ginzburg ziv that said if we have a, a group of order n, and I give you a sequence of 2n minus 1 elements, then there's always an n-term subsequence which sums to 0. Now we can we can consider that in a much kind of broader context. So uh, uh, what I want to imagine now is giving you kind of a set and some function. <clears throat> oh, what am I doing? Some function that assigns each element of this set uh, a, a label from our group. And now what I'm going to give you is a, a collection of subsets of S. <clears throat> and now the, the question is, when does there exist some member of C? One of the, my distinguished subsets of S, which sums to 0. Uh, so that when you sum up <clears throat> f over all those elements in C, you get 0. Right? So, so I, could, I could interpret that erdos ginzburg ziv theorem in this setting. Right? I would give you now, a, again, a group of order n, and I'll give you some set of size 2n minus 1 and the collection of all subsets of size n, that set. Right? Then erdos ginzburg ziv guarantees me that there's some, some member of my collection which sums to 0. Right? And you, you can play this game in a lot of different settings. And I'd like to, uh, I'd like to maybe describe, maybe I'll just describe one more and then, and then jump to my theorem. I'm, I'm a little, not super long on time here. Um, <clears throat> let me give you a, a nice theorem, which is of this flavor. So this is, uh, Bill Stocky calls this um, zero-sum Ramsey theory, right? So, uh, you know, in usual Ramsey theory, you, you, know, you take your, your object and you sort of color it with some finite number of colors and you look for a, like a monochromatic substructure. So here, instead of coloring with finitely many colors, think of you know, labeling with elements of some group. But now what we want is not, a, not something monochromatic, but something with the group element summed to zero. Um, OK, so let me tell you a nice theorem, theorem of this form. So there's a theorem due to Bielstock in Dierker that tells, that says, if uh, p is prime, and f is a func uh, function which assigns edges of the complete graph on p plus 1 vertices, labels from my cyclic group of integers mod p, there is a spanning tree 
such that the sum of the weights on that spanning tree is zero. So isn't that a funny thing? <laughs> you have a complete graph on p plus one vertices. We take some crazy labeling of the elements, whatever you like. With uh, 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 you label those edges with elements of the cyclic group of order p. Then there's some spanning tree so that the sum of the labels on those edges is zero. Um, now, I mean, you'll see a couple of uh, couple of important things. Once again, I mean, I, I couldn't hope for anything other than zero here, because I haven't assumed anything about your this function. This function is allowed to be identically zero. If it's identically zero, you're never going to get anything other than zero down here. So I, I, I couldn't have possibly replaced this with something non-zero. Um, there's also an important relationship here. Um, this wouldn't be true for k sub p plus 2. Well, another, another kind of stupid labeling is you could label everything 1. Right? If you label everything with 1, the only way you're going to get the sum of things to be 0 is if the number of things is a multiple of p. So it's very important here that the number of edges in the spanning tree is a multiple of p. But, uh, but thankfully, that's true on this guy, right? Is it um, true if the number of I mean, vertices is really a modulo, I mean, one modulo p? Or? Yes, yeah. Yeah, more generally, it's true, yeah. Um, uh, in fact, um, this theorem was then generalized, and maybe just to save space, the generalization is due to Furetti and Kleitman. <clears throat> um, and, and now I need the order of G. Oh, sorry, I don't want P prime. <laughs> I just want G abelian. The order of G is N. <clears throat> and now you use uh, uh, the complete graph on N plus 1 vertices. You'll, so again, that's. It's kind of necessary that the number of edges in the spanning tree here be a multiple of the order of the group. And, and zero is the only thing we could hope for. But then it's again true. <clears throat> what, how important is it that it's a spanning tree? What if you took Kn and you looked at the uh, Hamiltonian cycle? That's a very good question. Uh, for Hamiltonian cycles, uh, for Hamiltonian cycles, it's been looked at. Um, e um, there's a uh, uh, there's a class of exceptions uh -huh. that you can get, and it um, but it isn't large, and otherwise it's true. So you can get some exceptions by um, uh, by some stupid labelings. You take uh, you take all edges incident with this vertex and label them one, and label everybody else zero. <laughs> And then every Hamilton cycle sums to one. Mm -hmm. But apart from some, some kind of fairly well understood exceptions, uh, uh, it ends up being true. Um, but, but yeah, this is a very general framework that can be interpreted for a lot of different, um, a lot of different kind of set systems. There are a lot of nice questions on graphs here. Um, well, I should say, I mean, it seems like there are a zillion open questions. I mean, there are probably a few of them in there that are really nice ones. <laughs> but I. I, I I don't know. Anyway, um, <clears throat> uh, prompted by this, um, Seymour and Shriver set out to investigate uh, uh, weights of spanning trees. So, um, <clears throat> so they're going to consider the following. So, And they always called it weight, so maybe I'll switch to W. So uh, uh, G in abelian group, and I have some weight function that assigns each edge some, some value from the group. And I'm going to declare W of gamma to now be the set of all possible weights of spanning trees. 
uh, sorry. Let me say, uh, if if I give you any subset of edges, uh, uh, R subset of E, let's declare the weight of R to be the sum. And I'm going to declare W of the whole graph gamma to be the set of all weights of edge sets of spanning trees. OK. So we've got this sort of group labeled graph. And what I'm interested in is this sort of set of possible weights of spanning trees. Um, and this is not so far from some classical things, right? Like Kruskal's algorithm picks out like a minimum weight spanning tree. I mean, these, this is a sort of, you know, just some group labeled generalization. Um, and we could state fioretti kleitman in, uh, in this sense. So here there's a, maybe I'll switch to W. There's a spanning, oh, now I don't even need to say that. Now I could just say that zero is in W of uh, W of K N and plus one, right? So there's some spanning tree there that gets you that always gets you weight zero. So um, so Seymour and Shriver are going to look for a lower bound on this set. <clears throat> So they're going to look for a natural lower bound on the size of this set. Um, now I'm, uh, it's going to take me a moment to introduce this, but I want to, I, I want to kind of preempt that by showing you a, a particular case of interest for this problem. So suppose I just gave you two subsets of G, say A equals A1 up to AM, B equals b1 up to b sub n. <clears throat> well, here's a nice little graph. I could take just three vertices, and I'll take a, a stack of edges, one with each label a1, a2, up to a sub m on the bottom, and one with each label b1, b2, on up to b sub n on the top. <clears throat> All right, so that's nice. Nice little group labeled graph I've constructed. And you can see the set of all weights of spanning trees here. Well, a spanning tree is a particularly simple thing. You have to pick one of these edges and one of these. So the weights of the spanning trees here, in this setting, W of gamma is going to exactly equal A plus B. Right? So. Uh, a lower bound on the set of weights of spanning trees of this graph is going to give us a lower bound on the size of the sum set A plus B. And in fact, what, uh, uh, what Shriver and Seymour have done is to produce a natural lower bound on this W of gamma when G is the integer's mod of prime. And in fact, their theorem implies Cauchy-Davenport along these lines. So you can apply their theorem just to this uh, three vertex graph, and you'll recover Cauchy-Davenport. Now, I should say, their, their theorem doesn't actually give you a new, really a new proof of Cauchy-Davenport. It bootstraps Cauchy-Davenport. So we're going we're gonna to be repeatedly applying Cauchy-Davenport in the, in the proof. Uh, uh, but, the, but the ending statement is a, a sensible generalization. OK. Um, okay. So uh, yeah, so what I'm aiming toward now is I'd like to state um, a, a kind of a natural lower bound on the size of this set. And to do that, I'm going to need to introduce a, a, a new graph theory word here. Um, I, I should say, if, 
if you know what a Matroid is, all I'm doing is, is like a teeny bit of, 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 of like Matroid 101 here. Mm -hmm. um, and you should feel free to translate everything that I'm saying straight into Matroid language. For those of you who don't know Matroids, I mean, don't fear, I'm going to say it all at the graph level and let the Matroid theory people generalize. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the one concept I need is something coming from the binary incidence matrix. <laughs> Namely, I'm, I'm going to be interested in, uh, so in, I mean, this matrix, I've got a row for each vertex and a column for each edge, right? So if I give you a subset of edges, that's a set of columns here. And what I'm going to be interested in is the, the rank of that submatrix. Right? So for a set R, which is a subset of edges, we define the rank of R to equal the, the rank of that submatrix. Uh, um, let, let, me, let, let me rank at the submatrix given by V cross R. <clears throat> Right, so you just take all the vertices and you take just those, just those columns that correspond to R, and that's that's the rank of the set. No, we're gonna think out what this means, so don't get scared. Um, <clears throat> now, there's a there's a very easy fact here that uh, if I give you the edge set of a cycle. All right, so the edge set of a cycle, what's that look like? So it's like a 1 and a 1, and then a 1, and then a 1, 1, 1, and 1, and 1. And then the last one should be like this. Ooh. Right? So they, this is the first, so my, this is the first, second, third, fourth, fifth vertex of the cycle. The first edge joins the first two. The second joins the second and the third, and so on. And when you add up these columns, you get 0, because you've got exactly two ones in, uh, 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 in each row. <clears throat> so uh, a cycle, if I give you the edge set of a cycle, that's always going to be a, a dependent set of, of columns in this, this matrix. Um, on the other hand, if I give you a spanning tree, it's not hard to work out that a spanning tree is actually an independent set here. If you look at a spanning tree, so I give you some set of edges corresponding to a spanning tree. So let's, I'll call it T. So that's, a, uh, um, that's some subset of my columns here. If you have a spanning tree, there, it always has a leaf vertex. Right? So that's some vertex out here that's incident with only one edge of the tree. Right? So in other words, there's some row here that has a one in, in exactly in exactly one of these columns, right? Because your spanning tree, it will have a leaf vertex, and that's a vertex that's incident with just one edge of the tree. So what it means is that, um, so certainly this column is going to be independent of the rest, right? It's, it's not spanned by the rest. So you might as well just chuck that one, and now you've got a slightly smaller tree, and you know, repeating the same argument will tell you that this tree is actually an independent set. Right. So, if you look at uh, if you look at an arbitrary subset of edges, call it R, the rank of that set is the size of the largest forest it contains.
right? So if I give you the subset of edges, I mean, certainly if there's an edge in a cycle, then throwing it out doesn't change the rank of this set. So you might as well keep chucking edges out of cycles and that just reduces you to some, some forest, the biggest forest you contained. And that those guys are all gonna be independent. Right? You could complete them to a spanning tree. So the, the rank of, of, a, of a set R, that's really this, just this number of edges in the largest, largest forest your, your set contained. <clears throat> now, uh, okay. So now let me, um, now I'm, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and write up this bound and, uh, and then we'll kind of talk it through a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so here, gamma is a graph, W is a weighting in ZP. P is prime, and they are going to tell you that the number of distinct weights of spanning trees is at least the min of P. <clears throat> and the following quantity Uh, yeah, well, I'm just going to write this down and then we'll work out why it makes sense. So I, it's the sum over all group elements of the rank of those guys that got that label. <clears throat> Um, let's see, minus, uh, uh, let me, let me assume gamma's connected. <clears throat> um, so I need to subtract, uh, uh, basically the, um, the number of vertices minus three. Uh, the number of vertices minus two. <clears throat> okay, so this is a, it's a little bit of a funny looking formula. Uh, what I'd like to do is first just, just see how it lines up with, uh, with Cauchy Davenport on these very special graphs. So I'm, I'm interested now in graphs that are going to be just, uh, I didn't get them all, to, they're not all supposed to have the same size. Um, so it's a, a path plus parallel edges. So I'm going to label these with sets, A1, A2, A3, on up to uh, A sub K. <clears throat> Now in this case, what happens when you apply Cauchy-Davenport? Now, um, well, Cauchy-Davenport will tell me something about this sum set, A1 plus A2 plus on up to A sub K. What happens is basically every time you add two, you can just greedily add two of these sets. Every time you do an addition, either you get the whole group, in which case we're gonna have everything at the end, or the size of the sum set is at least the sum of the sizes minus one for that plus that you did. So if you've added up k sets here, the size of this is at least the min of p and the sum of the sizes of these ai's minus k minus 1. <clears throat> right, that's what Cauchy Davenport tells me. Now, what would Shriver Seymour be telling me in this case? <clears throat> Well, one thing you'll notice, the number of vertices in this graph is k plus 1. Or, sorry, it's 
Yeah, it's k plus 1. So this term here, when I apply it to this graph, that's k plus 1 minus 2. That's, that's that same minus k minus 1 that we see down there. Right? So this term is somehow corresponding to the number of pluses that we did. All right, so that term is just that. Why is this term equal to this? Well, in, in my case, these, these are sets. So um, for, for each group element, it, it, uh, it, it appears at most once on these elements. Right? So it appears maybe here and here and here, wherever. Uh, but in fact, the, if you look at the set of, of elements that receive a particular group label, that's always going to be a forest, right? You're never, you're never going to have a cycle because you're picking up most one thing from each of these. So if I count up over all group elements the number of things with that group label, that's exactly counting the size of these sets, right? So, so what's this, this funny looking bound here? It's, it's counting things sort of in a different way, but you can see that it lines up perfectly with what we had on, uh, at least on this graph. So it is, in fact, uh, a, a sensible bound. And uh, <clears throat> uh, in fact, more sensible is the proof. So the proof, the proof is actually quite, uh, um <clears throat> quite a natural one. So like the, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have to spend you a long time convincing that this convincing you that this bound is, is, is anything in any way reasonable, but, uh, but really it comes out of the proof. So, uh, okay, so let's, let's proof. So I'm going to, I'm going to go by induction on the, uh, say, number of vertices. Uh, oh, geez, do I care to look at what this is when there's, uh, so, sure, when there's, uh, this doesn't look good when there's one vertex, does it? Yeah. Oh, no, sorry, it's okay, right? So it's, uh, yeah, sorry, this is, I, I have, uh, this is minus minus, yeah. So this is, when there's one vertex in the game, I mean, when there's one vertex, you can't make any spanning trees, right? <laughs> I mean, no, there's, when there's one vertex, all the labels are trivial, and there's only one spanning tree. It's, I mean, it's just that one vertex, and the sum of the weights on its edges is zero. And in fact, this is giving you the bound one. So uh, the base case can be when size of v equals one, and we just check that it holds there. So I'm in good shape. <clears throat> Now what I'm going to do in the general case is I'm going to try and contract an edge. <clears throat> so I'm going to choose an edge UV. And uh, uh, <clears throat> I'm now going to define uh, uh, a certain subset of um, of group elements. <clears throat> so uh, let's define. A to be the set of all uh, group elements so that what's true so that when you look at all of those columns of this matrix whose edges get this label those columns span the column associated with UV. Let me say that a different way. So A is going to be the set of all group elements. So let, let me draw a picture. 
So, uh, yeah, I, uh, it's way easier with a picture. So here's, here's u, here's v. <clears throat> now I'm going to be interested in focusing on, on edges with a particular group label, say group label g. What I'm interested in is, are, is there a path of edges of group label g which connect these two endpoints? Okay, so A is going to be the set of all group elements G, so that there's some path from U to V of edges with label G. <clears throat> Let me call that edge E. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to contract the edge E and I'm going to apply induction. Uh, uh, g contract the edge e. So that edge e has gone away. <clears throat> I'm going to be interested in applying induction, so I want to apply this bound here. <clears throat> the set of all weights I get in g contract e this is at least the, the minimum of P and the sum over all these group elements of the rank in G contract E of those things that got labeled G minus, well now the, my number of vertices will have, uh, my number of vertices will have dropped by one. So this is minus number of vertices. <clears throat> so the, the, this graph is it's equal, to, um, it's equal to this one minus one. So this is minus v minus three. Now what I want to do is I want to focus on this quantity. <clears throat> now what I claim here <clears throat> is that uh, so you see, I'm interested in the rank of the set of things of label G after you've contracted the edge E. Right? Now, if you had a, a set of, I mean, if you had a path of things of label G that spanned this guy, then when you contract these, the, the rank of that set with label G is going to go down by one. You can't find as large of a forest using those, those edges. Right. Conversely, if you didn't have a, 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 a path of label G connecting these two vertices, then when you contract this edge, that rank of that set stays the same. Right? So this, this is, a, I mean, there's a, there's a, I mean, there's a thing to check here. Uh, but we're short on time, so I will let you check this for yourself. So the point is that this bound here, it looks almost like our old bound. This is, this is at least the min of P and the sum overall G in ZP of the rank 
in the original, except now I have to subtract the size of A. <clears throat> no, I should have given this um, yeah, let's, <laughs> sorry, let me, um, let me give this quantity a label. This is T. So I'm trying to prove weight of gam, the number of weights of, 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 of spanning trees is at least T. So I can write this as, so what have we got now? I've learned that the number of weights of spanning trees in gamma contract D is at least what we actually wanted t <clears throat> minus the size of a and plus 1. All right, so that, that uh, um, uh, sorry, I should, uh, I, I had better separate this from this from this. I'm going to call this T. So the set of weights of trees that you see after contracting E the size of that set, it's either P or it sizes at least what we, what we were hoping for minus the size of A plus 1. Now here's the, the, the key. I claim that the set of weights of gamma, oh, sorry, the set of weights of actual trees is a superset of the weight of gamma contract E plus A. So in other words, what I'm claiming is if you found any spanning tree in gamma contract E, you could add to it an element of A and get the weight of a spanning tree in the original graph G. Now remember what the set A is. A is a set of all group elements G that look like this. So let's suppose I gave you a spanning tree after contracting the edge E. So we contract the edge E and I give you a spanning tree. So here it is. Bup, 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 bup. Right, so I've contracted E and I'm giving you some spanning tree. That has some lovely weight. Now I claim that I could take that tree and add one edge of label G to it and get a spanning tree in the original graph. Well, that's true, right? So this was a spanning tree after you contracted the edge, this edge between u and v. So when you uncontract that edge, I mean, it's, it's almost like a spanning tree, except it's got two components, right? One component contains u and one component contains v. Well, if you have a path of edges, all of label g in your graph, that connect u and v, then you could add one of those edges to the, to the, to the blue set here and have a spanning tree in the original graph. So in other words, if you take any spanning tree that you got after contracting this edge, you could always add back to that one of these edges of label G and get a spanning tree in the original. And that tells me that the set of weights of spanning trees in the original graph, it includes all the possible weights you could get here, plus any of those guys, plus any group element G that had a path like this. And now you can see that we're home free. Well, um, I mean, so this by Cauchy Davenport, this is, this is uh, at least the size, well, sorry, this, sorry, I'm going to apply Cauchy Davenport in a second. I mean, so this is just true. By Cauchy Davenport, this is at least the min of P and the sum of these sizes, but, um, but the sum, uh, the min of p and the sum of the sizes of these minus 1. But when I add up that, I get exactly t. It's minimum of p and the size of this uh, 
But what I have here, I know that this guy is at least this quantity. So this is again at least the min of p and uh, uh, the and t, and that's the proof. So it's it's I mean there's a there's this concept of rank that we've thrown around here, but the essence of the argument is actually a very simple bootstrapping, right? At the end of the day, I mean, and so the like the formula ends up being awfully complicated, but you see it's measuring exactly what you want, right? So when you when you go to contract your edge e, if there was a path of things labeled g connecting those endpoints, then the rank of that set is going to go down one, but that that. But then that, that's a group element that kind of contributes over here. And if it doesn't go down one, then it's, then it's, contributing, you know, then it's contributing over here. So we get full credit for all of these. And that, uh, that's the proof of, of, of Shriver Seymour. Um, let me say that uh, uh, it's, it's wide open to do this for abelian groups. I mean, we saw before that even, even just in this case, Shriver Seymour already had the power of Cauchy Davenport, right? Um, now, we have a generalization of Cauchy Davenport to abelian groups. That's Knazer. <clears throat> so we've got, uh, I mean, there's the sort of Cauchy Davenport theorem. It gets, there's a generalization to abelian groups due to Knazer. There's this weird sort of generalization to graphs due to Shriver Seymour. There's a, I mean, I, I won't say it properly. It's a little bit nasty to say, but it's, but it's suitably natural. There's an obvious generalization of this thing that uh, uh, should, should be a common generalization of both this Shriver Seymour theorem and uh, Knazer's, and Knazer's theorem, and that's, uh, that's wide open. It's, a, it's quite a lovely problem, too. So uh, I, I apologize. I've run a little bit over time, but uh, I think maybe it's a good time to stop. Thanks.